I get the awesome uh, post-lunch slot, so if I see anyone falling asleep, I'll just yell really loudly into the microphone. Um, first time in Stockholm, which is great for me. Somewhat disorienting, because it's like everyone is beautiful and like twice as tall. Um, and like you know, because you walk into the hotel bathroom and the, the bottom of the mirror starts like right here. <laughs> and it's like this is not useful to me like at all. Um, anyways, segue into talking about the customer as the channel. So what I do for DVF um, is I it's called relational marketing. Uh, it's essentially experiential marketing, but it deals also with uh, behavioral implications of data and analytics, so kind of tying everything together uh, from inception to usefulness uh, as far as like an actual application. So um, the idea of the customer as the channel uh, kind of grew out of what we think of today, right? We think of digital, physical, mobile, um, desktop, uh, what's really important though, like practically speaking, because can't we be in stores and be on the phone at the same time? Um, what is that? How do you classify that? So this idea, this reorientation as the customer as a channel um, kind of gets us to a more channel agnostic place. It's a small uh, adjustment, but it's a very important one. Um, and we have to rethink that approach. So I'm going to actually talk a little bit as a segue um, about my time at Gucci, because about halfway into my tenure there, this uh, kind of wild, long-haired, uh, quiet, kind individual named uh, Alessandro Michele took over um, and kind of completely changed our uh, product, obviously, changed our brand, um, reinterpreted it, and gave me a lot of work to do uh, because we were trying to figure out who this new customer is. So we created these um, persona projects, right? And we zeroed in on uh, four uh, key demographics. Um, demographics, but they're really psychographics. We'll get into that in a little bit. So the millennial, uh, the fashion forward client, uh, the fashion forward female, uh, the men's client, and the Chinese tourist. We'll talk about not all of them, but the millennial. So if you guys had to guess, clients aged 18 to 34, what percentage of the customer base of Gucci do you think they represent? I want, I want like an answer here. So I'm gonna call on someone, maybe. Or just yell it out anonymously. That's fine too. 30? Okay, we'll go with 30. Price is right. Um, actually, it was 53% of clients. That's insane, right? Um, from a high luxury brand, over half of your clients are millennials, um, albeit with lower spend, uh, but they are definitely coming to shop, right? And that was the first data point that they made me run like seven times over because they didn't believe it. 45% um, of the US where I was based, that's millennials, but 53 globally were millennials, okay, 53%. Um, and that kind of flew in the face of everything that we expected. Um, and the next thing was that we looked at um, device usability and we compared it against um, the non-millennials and the millennials preferred to come into the store uh, and transact more often, uh, which was definitely the shock, right? And that data point went against everything conventionally that I'd known as well. Uh, but kind of thinking about it in a more holistic psychological way it actually makes sense because let's say $800 to a millennial is not the same as $800 to um, a 50-year-old executive. And so if they're going to spend their money, their hard-earned money on Gucci, then they want to come in and get the whole experience. They might already know exactly what they want, but they're going to want uh, also the whole nine yards as far as treatment. Um, so that was really kind of the first... Uh, reimagining of like how do we think about our clients today because uh, this is totally against type. Um, so what are the new requirements for winning your client's attention? And the wording on that again is very specific because usually that says engagement. But for uh, luxury brands especially, we're very used to uh, not having to compete, right? or letting the customer come to us first. We're really good at that. 
um, just waiting. And uh, now in today's marketplace, you have to go out there and you have to compete for it, uh, not with just with other brands, but obviously with uh, other mediums. And uh, there's a different type of competition every day. So I want to talk about what we did uh, as an experiential moment for Diane von Furstenberg, where I am now. Um, we decided to throw a series of events over five days um, to celebrate International Women's Day. Now, Diane's pretty popular this side of the world, right? Belgium, yeah, that whole thing. Um, she uh, is obviously very uh, known for female empowerment, right? And equality and the advancements uh, of half of our population. And so this seemed like a very organic thing to do to not just throw an event for the sake of an event, but to tie it to uh, something relevant, right? And uh, my part of the job was to understand how to create an interactive space that would actually make sense um, and create an enhancement for the attendees because we had uh, panels uh, with very notable people on them, anywhere from uh, Esther Perel to the Parkland shooting survivors. Um, so there was going to be a lot of traffic, and we wanted to create an environment where um, people would stay and interact with the brand and engage in a dialogue with us. So we did a uh, few things. First one was we integrated, that's Diane, wearing Spring 18 with a uh, mixed reality headset on. That's one of my favorite pictures of all time. Uh, because she actually saw herself in the file. The file that she was looking at was um, our Spring 18 show that we had shot in advance uh, you know, for this particular moment. And um, this would be in the stores uh, across three headsets. Uh, and we also had another video that showed um, the manufacturing process behind our in-charge tote bags. So in-charge was the mantra of the moment uh, for International Women's Day events. And um, kind of allowing the customer to get a front row view um, of either manufacturing or being um, an attendee at the fashion show, so that exclusivity. And the idea was that the product physically was all around you, so it would give more life to it. Um, that black and white photo is a famous photo of Diane. It's called, we affectionately call it the cube photo. Um, the uh, quote on it is actually a little bit outdated. It said, feel like a woman, wear a dress. And that was the time she was from. Now we kind of joke about that because she obviously wears the pants. Um, so you could recreate your own um, Diane von Furstenberg cube photo, uh, send it to yourself, uh, get physical printouts on the spot, um, and then obviously post it and share to social media. Same kind of idea with uh, the campaign video booth. So again, hashtag in charge. We asked um, Esther and a number of our panelists what it meant for them to be in charge as part of our campaign. So we wanted to give the opportunity to the user as well. Uh, to uh, film that and tell us what it meant for them to be in charge. And then lastly, we partnered with Microsoft to create um, a custom interface uh, that you could use to personalize limited edition product uh, that had in charge on it. Um, and then to the right of that is, to the left of that rather, is where the artisans would uh, create the customization on the spot. Um, so. This was all kind of happening in the same space, a lot of interactive uh, moments here, but obviously there were some goals, right, to showcase a new collection, uh, data capture, right, uh, and to create a steady pipeline of user-generated content that we could use, um, and then, of course, personalization. So, again, here, talking to this crowd, you guys are pretty advanced, and um, none of this is exactly new uh, as far as technological uh, advancements, right? But the main thing here was how do you actually tie it into the brand ethos in a practical way, in a way that the user gets immediately without having to think about it. And to also empower the user to want to create that dialogue with you and to create their own content. Um, just using tech as a medium by which to do that. So I want to show a short clip. Charge means 
being fearless. Being in charge means using your voice. Go for it. So a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of forward planning um, for 28 seconds of video. Thank you. Um, what was the actual result? I like to post this photo because this is like the architecture layout of it because that's what I was staring at all day long. Um, trying to really collaborate across teams, right? Because it's not just a digital thing. It's not just a stores thing. It's a store architecture. It's um, e-commerce trying to figure out how to you know, create uh, the feed directly from the devices into your platform. So um, it was a collaborative, integrative effort across teams um, that I can't really even take all the credit for because it really takes that village to make something happen practically um, using the brand platform. So quick results, um, data capture uh, for that one location went up 3.5 times the entire company uh, year over year. Uh, the photo video booth uh, content generated 2.6 views per email. Uh, the average uh, was 1.4. So this felt more relevant. They kept revisiting it, uh, posting it. Um, almost a third of all the units purchased was the customizable product. Uh, and leading to us beating the overall results plan uh, as far as the event by 21%. Uh, the average spend from the VIP client experience, a major component of which uh, included a guided walkthrough of the various tech components, uh, it was 3.75 times that of a non-VIP. And most interestingly, in the 15 days following that event, uh, nearly 40% of those clients already transacted, 75% of the sales coming from e-commerce. So we were fortunate enough to get covered um, with regard to uh, creating an immersive experience um, and you know, being selected for the Glossy Awards. But the main thing is, is you know, how do you create something that people want to interact with and stay? But curiously, that's actually not enough. I'm a firm believer, um, and a lot of the colleagues that um, I really respect believe the same thing. because. Experiential marketing is so hot right now. Wait, I just quoted Zoolander, so hot right now. Um, the way to drive traffic may be experiential moments, but how do you get them to convert uh, on the spot? More importantly, uh, how do you create retention, which is the building block of loyalty? Um, it can't just be through a cool interactive environment. So the question is, what can actually be leveraged outside of fashion? Um, just because we've actually heard a lot of you know, different speakers today kind of talk about uh, cross-referencing other best practices to enrich the industry we're in. So I actually didn't start in fashion. I ended up working for um, that guy, the little guy who looks like the old dude from Up. Um, his name is Aaron Beck. He developed cognitive therapy. Um, kind of turned a lot of the psychodynamic uh, models of psychology on their heads uh, with this kind of very basic, basic uh, foundational building block, but it made all the difference um, in approach. So we all know that we're in an emotional industry, right? Um, people don't necessarily need a $2,600 cotton embroidered hoodie from Gucci, but that becomes a need somewhere along the spectrum because it's an emotional attachment. So if emotion is so important, what goes into building that? It's actually perception. Perception comes first. So if this is true, then that changes your entire approach to focusing on perception. So it becomes an information processing model. How a person processes this info impacts what you feel. So that led to an operational model called the cognitive triad that acted like essentially um, a rose-colored pair of glasses is usually what is used to describe this. So you put a pair of rose-colored glasses on, you see everything as that color. Same kind of thing. Basic foundational beliefs uh, operating behind the scenes um, with regard to the self, the environment, and the future. They all interact uh, in a way that influences the way that you perceive things. So the same event, identical event, will have two different reactions from two separate people. Uh, the classic example is getting bumped into on the New York subway. That's very relevant for me every day. 
So based on the nuances of someone's triad, one person will uh, attribute it as, um, well, this was on purpose, this person meant to do it, um, I have to watch out for myself, versus the other uh, will say, you know what, it was a discrete phenomenon. Um, the environment is usually uh, benign, and uh, it's probably an accident. So this has real application, um, and it's a very simple, simple theory, but it's uh, actually, as far as the nuances goes, um, it's actually quite challenging to do uh, in a practical way to apply. So rose-colored glasses, it's been adapted for use in multiple government and business scenarios, um, and has been applied successfully to interpersonal training and digital marketing. So you, if you understand that, you understand how they're gonna react, okay? So why do we care about this? Uh, there's a couple of applications right away. And we've talked about uh, how this kind of change, how other industries and other best practices in tech, obviously in general, um, how does that affect training and curriculum, right? So if brick and mortar isn't actually dead, it just has to be reimagined into an experiential moment, then interaction is of paramount importance. And who are we interacting with? The people who are am our ambassadors, the store associates, right? Do we have uh, systematic clienteling training that not only goes uh, into the best practices of retail, but also the best practices of understanding a human being. So it's taking it back, it's rolling it back to people buy clothes. So why not go back to understanding people or the basic elements and reverse engineer it? So this is a brief preview of a, um, a clienteling training uh, that we're, we have just finalized for DVF. Um, and it's, we say behavioral application because that's not necessarily just brick and mortar. Because obviously, um, you know, dot .com, uh, customers will call in uh, and they will interact with someone real time. Um, and they're gonna have to be trained on this as well, is how to understand someone at their core. Uh, because when you're talking about a non-need becoming a need, like a, let's just say a $1,600 handbag, it's important to understand what they're buying, absolutely, but it's really important to understand why they're buying it. Is it because there's an emotional attachment to the mom because she loved DVF? Is it a purchase that's meant to signify uh, the first corporate job that this person has had? Um, is it the latest fashion item? Those are all very true things, but very different things for different people, and how do you understand that and create experiences um, in order to customize properly? This goes to the core of behavioral science. Um, and also, very briefly, I want to touch on how this actually was applied digitally, right? This was a test that we conducted in 2013 at Jet Setter. Uh, is, any, is everyone familiar with Jet Setter? It's part of Guilt Group, okay? Everyone know Guilt Group? So luxury online retailer um, specialized in flash sales uh, during the downturn in 2008. Uh, they had a luxury travel division called Jet Setter. And uh, we noticed that we had um, certain customers who were very engaged. Uh, we had a huge database, uh, but they didn't actually purchase, so they browsed a lot. We appended data, um, and we understood that the largest segment was non-buyers, females ages 25 to 34, um, income of 150K, uh, as far as uh, their uh, profession, and then they were also single. So things you could easily obtain through a standard data append uh, through your CRM. So without getting too specific to be exclusive, overly exclusive, or offensive, um, what was the possible base level cognitive triad that we could write for them? Beliefs of the self, well, they're successful, right? Every measure that we see, they're um, earning uh, above average. Um, also, they lived in a major metropolitan city, right? Uh, they're driven, perhaps they're too busy. Um, the world and environment, well, that kind of goes in line with that because they're able to get what they want. So they learn from that. It's operant conditioning in psychology. And in the future, there's no reason for them to believe that it'll stop. So. Um, they more or less subconsciously believe that it'll continue to give them that. 
So what we did was we did a three-way test to control for the, um, just the text. So that's like the standard guilt tied email, tiled email on the left, the um, sub control on the, in the middle, and then the control or the, the test version with the text uh, that was written around the cognitive triad uh, on the right. And this is kind of what it spoke to. Um, we work so you can play, go ahead, recharge, relax, adventure, explore, leave the daily grind behind because goodness, goodness knows you've earned it. Just to get you started, we've tailored a special list of hotels below exclusively for you. We deal that up to 35% off. It's easier than ever to get away for a month, a night, or any time in between. You're in the driver's seat. It's about time to get what you really want. So less about product messaging, more about psychographic messaging. But psychographic messaging these days, that's a word that's kind of thrown around, right? What are the nuances in psychographics? Is it a motivational model? Or is it a information processing model? because that will make a huge difference in what's effective and in shaping your approach. So what did it do? As far as engagement, um, the bounce rate was cut in half for the people who received the test version. Uh, pages per visit went from 3.9 to 5.2. Um, and the time spent on the site uh, doubled. So engagement, all the checks, um, the boxes were checked off for uh, revenue, the conversion rate, and per visit value went up. So this is a pretty old school test these days, right? Like in fashion, wow, this is like groundbreaking. But who I'm talking to right now, this is uh, the basic segment approach, but just kind of couched in uh, evidence-based psychological methodology that we've known to be true um, in the field itself, in the field of psychology. So imagine what we could do if an information processing model off the cognitive triad was built into an algorithm and combined with product information or browsing behavior. So immersive experiences, customer as a channel, strategic integration. And the last question is what really needs to change in organization, right? Because I'm seeing some pretty amazing advances here. Um, that are really game changers. And the question is, how do you get a DVF, a Gucci, uh, so on and so forth, to apply that to their organization? Um, is anyone from Facebook here? No? OK, good. Because um, I was at their offices the other day, a few weeks ago, and even independently of me creating these slides, um, you know, they were talking to uh, retailers, uh, high-end retailers, and, and this is what their, their, their takeaways were. Connecting online to offline is the next evolution. Customer is the channel. They stole my phrase. Um, leverage your strongest signal and largest asset, the stores, right? Because that's what digitally native brands don't have. But do it in a way that's integrated, not just stores, but experiences that integrate advancements and enhancements through tech and build a bridge practically between marketing and IT, right? So how many organizations don't have that? Number three is huge. That's everything. Um, to give IT and tech a seat at the table just like a head of marketing, um, just like uh, an events director. Because if you're thinking about events, but you're not thinking about data capture, and you're not thinking about tech and integration, then you're working twice as hard with minimal out output. Yeah, I think that's it.